Those people, I suspect, feel that their work isn't important. It isn't, it's not meaningful. What do you think defines whether something's important or not? I think there's two ways to look at that. One of them is time. <clears throat> I want to take a look at an average day. We're just going to take out a third of it for sleep. About a third of it is our work. What's the other third? It's miscellaneous, isn't it? It's a little bit of uh, maybe a little time with our family, a little bit of time watching TV, maybe some church activities. Um, are there any, is there anything related to work that ends up in this other part here? Maybe a little bit of commute time? I drive an hour and a half back and forth every day. Do we, do we take our work home with us sometimes? Do we think about our work? You know? So the point I'm making is over half of our waking hours are devoted to work in one form or another. Okay? And you could say over half our life, really, when you think of it that way, is devoted to our work. So just by that measure alone, our work is important. Here's another way to think about what's important. Um, as Christians, we think about what, what does God think is important, right? <clears throat> well, the Bible has over 500 verses related to this issue of work. So, by any measure, I think we have to say that, that God thinks our work is important as well. So let's talk a little bit about what the Bible has to say about our work. Genesis uh, 2, verse 2 says, on, on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Um, John 5, 17 says, uh, Jesus said, My Father has been working until now, and I have been working. And there are other verses, but that what those verses tell me is that God, by his very nature, is a worker. Okay? And the Bible tells us that God never changes. He's always been the same. He always will be. So, that's a part of who God is. Well, the Bible also tells us that we're made in His image, so that tells me that we are also inherently workers. That's part of our DNA, okay? Um, another thing that I learned reading the Bible about uh, work is that work is good. Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Okay, this was not uh, toil. This was a good thing. This was a gift from God that God gave to Adam, and it was one of the first things that God did after he created man. Um, you may have heard the idea that yeah, the work became toil um, after, Adam, after uh, God cursed, cursed the work. He didn't actually curse work. He cursed the ground. He didn't curse work. And after... This was with uh, Adam. And after uh, Noah got off the ark, it said that no longer would God curse the ground. So I would, just to kind of put to rest this issue of whether God meant work to be good, I would make the case that God clearly intended work to be good from the beginning. And if there was any curse related to that, it, it was gone uh, after Noah's ark. But even if you questioned that, um, if you look in the New Testament, it says that we are redeemed from the curse of the law. And that applies to everything that's related to a curse. So those are just a few verses to give you encouragement that not only are you a worker, did God intend you to be a worker, but that work is, is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Um, Another thing I learned is that God wants us to work. He also gives us some reasons why he wants us to work. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 12 talks about how a laboring man has good sleep. How many of you can relate to whether you put in a good day's work, whether you have a good night's rest? I mean, that's just a natural benefit of work. Um, the book of Proverbs is filled with, with promises about our work that are related to the idea of provision. I heard comments made about work means providing for your family. That's a natural result of our work. Um, in order for, to, for us to be able to provide for ourselves 
as well as for others, and to give us the ability to give to others. So those are just some natural reasons why God wants us to work. But I believe that God's purpose for our work is bigger than that. It's bigger than those tangible things. Those, those blessings that we get from work are great, and those are things God wants for us. But I think that um, too often we relegate our work to something that's secular and in the flesh and not something that's divine and a divine appointment or something that's spiritual. And um, when I thought about what was the purpose of our work, I really thought about what was the purpose of, of our life in general. In Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And Jesus affirmed that in Matthew 22 when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> so I believe that God's greatest commandment for us is also God's greatest purpose for our lives and that because our work is such a big part of our life that it is also the purpose of our work. Um, let me ask you this, why did God create Adam? Was it because he had this garden and he really needed some help gardening? No, of course not. He created Adam because he wanted to have a relationship. You know, God is three persons, one God. His very nature is relationships. And he created man, he created you and me to be in relationship with us. But um, that relationship has to be uh, a choice, a choice on each of our parts. And we already said that God gave work to Adam as a gift. So if his purpose of creating Adam was to be in a relationship, is there some kind of connection there? And I, I think that the work that God gave to Adam was an opportunity for Adam to be in relationship with God, to express his love for God, to say, God, you've given me this gift. You've asked me to be a steward of it. I'm going to show my love for you by how I manage what you've given me. So, if we accept the premise then that the purpose of our work is to actually be in relationship with God, which is probably a new, maybe a new way of thinking about our work, not something that we've thought about before, what does that look like in practical terms? You know, what, how do you go to work on Monday and live out your relationship with God? Well, I have some thoughts on that. Um, my first thought is what not to do is don't think of your work as a, um, a performance measure of your relationship with God. This is not a legalistic, now I have to do this, this, this at my job in order to show that I love God. That's us guys are good at that, right? We're, we're good at turning this thing into a list. You know, if we look at Christ as a model for our lives, certainly loving others, serving others, that, that was a big part of it. Um, and we, we all, there's so many opportunities to do this at work if we just pay attention, you know. How we treat people really matters. Amen. And, um, you know, if you start to actually listen to people and don't just say hi in the hall and move on, uh, it's amazing what you can learn about people and what they're going through and, and, uh, and just a simple prayer or a word of encouragement can, can go a long way. And there's so many people that we interact with at our job that your pastor will never, well, pretty much everybody you interact with, your pastor will never see or speak with. So you have a huge opportunity where you work in this regard. And I've heard it said that no two people in the world will ever walk the same footsteps. And that's so true. Nobody ever will ever follow the same path that you do. And a lot of those steps that you make will be on the job. So the last one is, is uh, the assignment is one that I think we oftentimes immediately think of when we think of faith in the workplace. And that is to disciple and evangelize. And this one's kind of 
Interesting. You know, um, I think that we make two mistakes with this. Uh, one, they're both extremes. On the one extreme, we can think that, that's, that this is the sum total of what it means to live out our faith at the workplace. You know, we need to, to be telling, sitting at the water cooler telling people about Jesus or handing out cards to the next service at our church. Or we need to be holding a Bible study with other believers at, um, at lunchtime. And there's nothing wrong with those things. Those are not only good things, I believe they are assignments from God. Um, but if, we, if that's all we think of when we think of our faith in the workplace and we miss out on all these other things I've talked about, I think that's a mistake. The other mistake is by just taking those things off the table. You know, um, some, some of us may have been raised with the idea that your faith is a private matter, you, know, you don't talk about politics or religion, that kind of thing. And certainly in the workplace, you don't talk about your faith. And I think that's another mistake on the other extreme. You know, so I think that we have to, I think we should really be in prayer about this and think about what God's will is for our lives. And, and are we ever going to, at the end of our lives, look back and say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have, you know, dis discipled and evangelized at work. I don't think well, any of us will say that. <laughs> so I think um, we should look for opportunities to, to love God and to live up his assignment in this regard. Okay. I don't know how I'm doing on time, Chuck, but I got one. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about is to kind of, hopefully to try to kind of tie all this together is this idea of work-life balance, okay? We hear a lot about work-life balance. It might mean different things to different people. <clears throat> Typically when you hear it, the next thing you hear is we need to work less and, and have more life, right? Um, in a church setting, we often heard it, we, we, we see it uh, described this way. God should be first, right? What's second? Yeah, usually it's family or I even heard it ever about about I've heard it said, you know, marriage first, then kids, because you don't want to let your kids be more important than your marriage, right? And then what's fourth? Work. Anything else? <laughs> Whatever. You know, the rest of our life. Does this actually work? I would, I would say the answer is no. Part of the reason it doesn't work is because of this chart we started with here. Okay? The fact is we are spending most of our waking hours at number four. So to sit here and say that this is my new plan, this is how I'm going to live my life, I don't think that's realistic and I think we end up throwing up our hands and just discarding it. I heard a sermon this past year that I thought was really helpful for me. And our pastor said a better approach is to put God at the center, okay, of our world. And it then influences all these other things, right? Work, marriage, kids. For me, it's a better way to think about it if we come back to the fact that God is our source, He is the center, and should be integrated into every part of our lives, it is a more practical way to approach this work-life balance issue. Because the, to me, the alternative is a compartmentalized life, okay? Where we have God in a box here, and what does that box look like? Maybe church on Sunday, maybe... Wednesday night, maybe a little prayer time here and there. And then we got this big box that's our work. And then a box that's our marriage and on and on. And <clears throat> unfortunately, we end up with this, which we said we don't even know what that is, right? So I, I did this just to illustrate that if we took this approach, and if over half of our waking hours, our work, we're actually, we actually were living out this purpose of loving God and integrating our, 
our relationship with God into our work, this, this part of the cross, we might actually look more like a Christian instead of being a Christian that just goes to church on Sunday and you don't even know what that looks like, right? 